All right, earlier today, a federal judge denied a request from the Department of Justice to say that the July 4th uh, order by a judge limiting Biden, the Biden administration's communication with social media companies due to First Amendment concerns, well, he denied their request to overturn that order. Uh, you'll remember this temporary injunction came in response to lawsuits from attorney generals in Louisiana and Missouri, whose filings described the actions of the Biden administration as the, quote, most egregious violations of the First Amendment in the history of the United States of America. Now, this has been court documents. Join me now to get his reaction to today's decision by the court in Louisiana is the Mater Missouri Attorney General Andrew Bailey. General Bailey, welcome back to the program. Thank you for having me on. Now, I, I want to get your reaction. The Justice Department requested a stay on the judge's temporary injunction from last week that was, uh, it rejected that today. Um, to me, this is pretty straightforward. The, the, the earlier order just said, look, no more of this collusion with the social media giants to silence disfavored speech. The court today said, uh, no to their effort to push that aside. Your thoughts? Yeah, one wonders why the Biden administration is trying to appeal the court order. The court order merely says that the Biden administration can't violate the Constitution. It's a 155-page order, but most of the, those uh, are just documenting the instances in which the, the Biden administration appears to have violated the First Amendment in the past. And so all the judge said is, hey, we're going to start to erect this wall of separation between tech and state, and you can't violate the the, the uh, constitutional right to free speech in the future. Why would they appeal that? And so then they, they file this notice of appeal, say that they're going to suffer irreparable harm to the national security apparatus if they don't get a stay of the district court order. And the district court today evaluates it and says, well, look, DOJ, you haven't put on any evidence or shown me anything that would, that would demonstrate that lawful behaviors are curtailed under this order. All we're saying is you can't violate the Constitution. Yeah, that was my that was my thought when I read the initial order that normal activity that would be, you know, protecting national security or other violations of the law were still allowed to take place uh, under the judge's July 4th order. So in their appeal, it suggests to me that they want to continue to silence his favorite speech. That's absolutely right. They want to continue to suppress Americans' free speech, and they only target conservative voices. Anything that the federal bureaucrats or Joe Biden disagree with or think is not true, they want the right to silence. Certainly, the First Amendment prohibits that. The court picked up on that. That's why we have this nationwide injunction. And really, it's dripping with irony if you think about it. The same screaming heads that are saying that this uh, this court order is the end of the world, that it's going to destroy coordination between the government and, and big tech, uh, are, are sowing disinformation under the guise of trying, trying to protect us from disinformation. What's the timeline of this case as it moves forward? Um, this is a temporary injunction, as you pointed out, that prohibits the Biden administration from, you know, and I'll use the term colluding because that's what it is, with uh, social media giants. So what is the timeline in which we could see this case progress? Well, I anticipate that we'll be in the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. Uh, the Department of Justice, I believe, has instantaneously requested a review of the trial court's denial of that stay uh, and will seek its, a stay at the Fifth Circuit. So they're going to go to the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals and make the same argument. And I think that we'll be successful on the merits. I think that the court, the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, maybe by the end of the week, probably by the end of next week, will, have de will also have denied the Department of Justice's request for a stay and the injunction will be in place. Then we get to the merits discovery. Look, we've only begun to scratch the surface. We know that Trojan horse, or excuse me, that COVID was the Trojan horse that allowed the enemy behind the gate that justify, allowed the federal government to justify the censorship enterprise, but it's expanded, it's grown, and it's become so big that it can only be described as a vast censorship enterprise, the nerve center of which is, is housed in the Department of Homeland Security. We've got to keep uncovering every stone, leaving no stone unturned to root out this vast censorship enterprise and continue to build that wall of separation between tech and state to protect our First Amendment, especially as we move into an election cycle. Well, that, that was going to be my question, General Bailey. Is this a part of them seeking uh, this, in, this stay on this uh, temporary injunction? Is they're afraid this could go into the next election and they want the ability to continue to suppress the speech of Americans, conservatives? 
I think that's absolutely true. I mean, that's what they're committed to. They don't think that they've done anything wrong. They're unrepentant and they're willing to do it again. When we went to court on May 26th, they were specifically asked by the judge whether or not it would be a violation of the First Amendment for the federal government to suppress an American citizen's right to question the, uh, the, the result of an election. And the Department of Justice said, well, it depends. They're unwilling to commit to protecting core political speech. That's why the court order is so important. Now, with this court order in place, let's talk uh, theoretically here for just a moment about violations of this. Let's say the Biden administration, they don't get this injunction, the order stays in place, and they violate it. Number one, how will we know if they violate it? And number two, what could be the consequences for them and the social media companies that would collude with them? Well, we'll know because we're going to continue to monitor it through the discovery process. We will now have access to additional witnesses and innumerable documents and files and evidence. And so we're going to monitor it through that process. And if we find anyone violating the court order, we're going to move to hold them in contempt. And it's the power of contempt that compels the federal government to obey the constitutional protection of free speech. Can a hotline be set up for those within the social media world to uh, to offer tips if, in fact, uh, the Biden administration begins to lean on them again? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we need again, we're going to continue to erect this wall of separation between tech and state, and we're going to need everybody's help in identifying where that censorship is occurring to stay on top of. We've got to remain vigilant and, and protect the free, fair, and open marketplace of ideas, especially as we move into an election cycle. And we'll use every tool at our disposal to accomplish that. Long term, Congress probably needs to appoint an inspector general to monitor compliance with the court order. This is a lawsuit that's going to end up in the United States Supreme Court. It's the most important First Amendment lawsuit in a generation. We've uncovered the worst First Amendment violations in this nation's history. And again, we've only begun to scratch the surface. If we want to preserve our legacy of freedom, given to us by God and enshrined in the Constitution by our founding fathers and handed down to us as a legacy of freedom, we've got to stay on top of this. So you you do believe that we've talked about this before and you've said before you think this is going to end up before the United States Supreme Court. And of course, they issue opinions only once a year in June, pretty much of every year. Just uh, is this something you think they might pick up for next year or is this something that will be post-election before we'll actually have a, uh, a final adjudication on it? Well, I think final adjudication is going to take a year or two to, to get there. I mean, like I said, we've only scratched the surface. We need, need to get into the merits of the case. Now, if the Fifth Circuit uh, denies the, the, the trial court's injunction or you know overturns the trial court injunction or stays the trial court injunction or, or does something else, certainly we would seek uh, relief in the United States Supreme Court. And, and I assume that the Department of Justice would as well. So there may be preliminary matters that are going to get to the United States Supreme Court. But the, the heart of the case, uh, the merits of the case, and again, rooting out the vast censorship enterprise is going to take time, take effort, and take vigilance on, on behalf of Louisiana, uh, Missouri, and certainly the private plaintiffs as well. So this going back again to this order that was in place, this is critical then, because this is basically going to be the policy that's in place going into this election cycle and through this election cycle. So this is the one element that can essentially tie the hands of the left that ha that we know. As you said, this is not speculation. You have the evidence that they manipulated the uh, this virtual public square to benefit the left in the last election. That's absolutely right. And it's not just that we possess this quantum of evidence. We put on that evidence in court and convinced a judge that we're likely to succeed on the merits of our claim. He said there's likely a vast censorship enterprise, the nerve center of which is in the Department of Homeland Security, and that, uh, you know, in court, when, the, when uh, the judge looked at the Department of Justice and said, well, give me one example of when you've ever silenced uh, censored speech uh, that wasn't conservative speech. The Department of Justice struggled to come up with an example. The only example they gave was one Democrat who disagreed with Joe Biden. So it clearly is being weaponized to silence dissent, which is the very purpose of the First Amendment. So, General Bailey, as this process goes on and you'll be making uh, more presentations to the court, you'll be doing more discovery. Will the public have the benefit of knowing more of what was going on behind the scenes in this process? Absolutely. We're committed to transparency. Certainly, we've released as much information uh, as we've been allowed to by the court within the confines of due process and due diligence. And we're committed to the, to the public understanding what went on here so we can prevent it from ever happening in the future. 
Well, I tell you what, we're so thankful for you and Jeff Landry leading the charge on this and, of course, grateful uh, the Fifth Circuit's decision, uh, well, the, the, the courts here in the Fifth Circuit, and then ultimately it'll be to the Fifth Circuit, but grateful uh, for this revelation that really answers a lot of questions of what we've been experiencing over the last several years when it comes to the social media, and, and grateful now that this uh, order is in place. So I want to switch gears for just a moment uh, in the few minutes we have left, uh, General Bailey. You joined with uh, six of your colleagues uh, last week in writing a letter to Target as uh, they were in Pride Month. Uh, basically warning them that they could be violating child protection laws with some of the uh, merchandise that they were marketing. Uh, ex explain that to our, our viewers and listeners. Well, we're not going to let the woke left sexualize children in the, in the state of Missouri. And certainly we have like-minded attorneys general in those other states that were willing to join with us. I mean, what the what the corporation did was deplorable, you know, trying to force values inconsistent with our values on us and, and then trying to shame us by claiming, hey, this is a celebration of diversity. It's not. It was a celebration of sexuality. It promoted uh, perverse sexuality and tried to force that upon children. Uh, you know, I, as a parent of four small children, I have a right to, to teach my children, uh, you know, things like that when and where appropriate under the uh, circumstances that I deem appropriate and 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 consistent with my my values. And so how dare uh, that corporation try to force that on the rest of us? And certainly there are uh, legal remedies at play if, if uh, laws were violated, but they're not pursuing profits anymore. They're pursuing a woke agenda and, and needed to be called out for that. Yeah, there's no question they're not pursuing profits. I mean, they lost $12 billion in market value as a result of a boycott because of uh, this pride display in, in the really grooming of children that they were doing. But what I find interesting, there were actually some of your colleagues on the other side of the aisle, some Democratic uh, state attorneys general, that wrote letters to Target when Target removed some of the displays. And, and I, what I find interesting about that is that these corporations, they feel like they're, you know, stuck in the middle between, you know, left and right, red and blue or whatever, however you want to describe it. But they picked this fight. They're the ones that stepped into the middle of this. If they would have just done business and not tried to get into these, uh, if you want to call them cultural wars or whatever you want to describe them as, they wouldn't find themselves between a rock and a hard place. Well, yeah, and that, that their excuse is total garbage. Show me one shirt that they've sold that has the text of the Second Amendment on it or that promotes the NRA or has a Bible verse on it. So they, they, they're pushing a left-wing ideology. They're not stuck in the middle of anything. They've chosen a side. Now they're paying the consequences as well they should. And we're seeing increasingly, we've talked about this on the program, how more and more Republican lawmakers are backing away from corporate America. And I find this actually quite satisfying honestly, because corporate America has aligned themselves with the social policies of the left, and now they're screaming because they have to live with their fiscal policies as well, and it's not good for business. Yeah, one wonders how much bargaining they'll, power they would have as corporations under Bernie Sanders' socialist agenda. A final question for you, uh, General, speaking on the, uh, the, the issue of what Target was doing with all this transgender uh, stuff, you've been investigating uh, the hospitals there in Missouri that were profiting and enticing uh, children, parents, into this pipeline of transgender, experimental transgender surgery and drug treatments. Any new uh, revelations on that front? Yeah, we continue to push that investigation forward, and we're not going to let up until we've rooted out any wrongdoing. Uh, you know, the whistleblower came forward several months ago, and we launched a multi-agency uh, investigation, the first of its kind in the nation. We led the state of Missouri on this issue. The General Assembly has since enacted a statute that, that eliminates this kind of woke left-wing quackery from uh, mutilating children in the state of Missouri. And I'm so proud to live in a state where we value the safety. I want Missouri to be the safest state in the nation for children. And this was a first step in achieving that objective. And we'll keep fighting to pursue that and holding wrongdoers accountable. Well, General, I want to say you're doing your part uh, to make Missouri a great state and to inspire other states to, uh, to take the same track. Uh, General Bailey, always great to see you. Thanks so much for uh, joining us today. Keep up the good work. Thank you, sir. Thank you for having me on.